sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, the gear shop, the optics department, and I want to remind you that Cody Nelson uh, is happy to field any questions that you have in regards to binos, spotting scopes, tripods, glassing techniques. Uh, He has also promised me that he will take care of the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners uh, that are interested in those tripods, binocular spotting scopes, rifle scopes, anything to do with glassing. So give him a call at 702-847-8747. You can, that's extension two. You can also email him at optics at gohunt.com. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. That's K-U-I-U.com. That's the gear that Dara and I wear on all our hunts. Uh, I want to thank uh, CanyonCoolers.com. If you use the J. Scott promo code or the J. Scott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount. I want to thank Phonescope.com. If you use the J. Scott 19 promo code, you're going to get a 10% discount. All of the photos and videos on my Instagram are through Phonescope, and then Onyx Maps. I want to thank Onyx Maps for their sponsorship. They are offering a 20% discount code to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. If you go to, if you use J. Scott 19, that's going to save you 20% there at Onyx Maps. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today is going to be a fun episode with Zach Sandow, the marketing project coordinator for Onyx Maps. Zach, how are you doing? Doing well. How are you doing, Jay? Uh, I'm doing just fine. I'm getting fired up to go to Mexico here in a few days and um, had had a great sheep uh, hunt in December and um, Dar's down in Mexico now and so I'm just uh, getting getting kind of prepared, getting all our food and getting packed and uh, getting all the vehicles, everything ready to go down. So I'm getting excited about that. I understand you've been in Arizona over the last month. What were you doing? Yeah, yeah. So I actually, for the first time, I decided to uh, take advantage of your guys' uh, December archery season. So I went down there for the opener, and I was out there for a week with a couple guys from Montana and one gentleman from Canada, and it was great. It was an awesome time. You know, Montana, our seasons kind of wrap up at the end of November, and so the ability to extend my hunting season, especially right before that Christmas time, was great. And it was uh, awesome. two ground. You know, we just found some public ground and went out there for all four of us had tags and we uh had to learn the country early but ended up at seeing plenty of deer had opportunities was not able to get it done but got very close and it's definitely something that will be on the list every year going forward right on that sounds great uh what area roughly you know were you by flagstaff were you by prescott or you know down south where were you uh, we were up over by flagstaff Okay, did you see deer rutting, or were they just getting started, or did you not encounter any rutting activity yet? Uh, towards the end of the trip. So early, we were just seeing does and then lone bucks, so a couple grouped up. But then the last, I want to say probably three or four days, we finally found a buck with a doe, and then kind of the last two days of the hunt, we were able to find a couple that had some does. But it looked like we were a touch early there. Um, I think we went, you know, we were there around the 15-ish. So yeah, it yeah. was uh, it was it wasn't going until right at as we had to leave, unfortunately. But we did get to see a little rutting activity. Yeah, I, I try and field a lot of those questions, and one of the big questions I get is, you know, when do those deer start rutting? And you know, normally those mule deer, especially in central and kind of that northern, you know, by Flagstaff, uh, certainly not up by the Kaibab or the Strip, they're already you know kind of done rutting, but. Uh, those deer around Flag and Prescott and what have you, those mule deer um, really get going right around Christmas time. Uh, so looking forward, you know, next year or the years after, uh, would you still go that early time frame or would you try and go after Christmas, like between Christmas and New Year's? I think I'd probably try to go after Christmas, but it is tough when, you know, my season wraps up, it's tough to not want to go out for that opener just because there's kind of that lull a couple of weeks. But I definitely think if we could have backed it up a little bit, we would have hit the rut much better, and we would have just seen more deer movement at that point. Yeah, for sure. Um, as far as country that you were hunting, were you were you able to find some broken country that you could glass, or did you, you know, stick in the thick stuff in the pines? And what was your method of, you know, kind of your strategy of, of hunting uh, coming to ground for your first time and trying to figure it out? 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when we first got down there, we just split up in groups of two, and we were just trying to cover country. And so we would get up high and try to glass the open areas. And the one thing that was kind of tough is there was a ton of traffic out there. I mean, we were seeing, I think we counted 18 rigs on opening day. And so really what we were doing is we were just trying to uh, find areas that were getting looked past. And we actually had a ton of success doing that. Um, It was kind of funny. I mean, there was one spot we were – only a couple hundred yards off the road, but there was a nice creek drainage and there was some water in the bottom and we were actually able to find 20 does down there. And as I see cars driving by, we're sitting there glassing. So really early, we were just trying to cover country and just get a lay of the land. And then we kind of figured out where the deer densities were and where these pockets that we could kind of glass. And it was mixed. You know, we were kind of, we went up high a little bit and there was, we had some success up there, but really we are down in the flats and we were just getting up on a point and glassing and we'd sit you know get super comfortable tripod 15 power binos and we'd glass for hours and just kind of cover and then we'd move and go find a different area and just keep glassing and that seemed to be that's how we were seeing the most deer for sure um and then once we kind of got an idea of where these deer were we could be a little bit more patient and meticulous on you know when we'd try to stalk in and so we'd find them try to get them bedded up and then we would plan our approach from there you know coming down was this your first time in arizona or had you had other trips uh hunting trips down here no this was my first time in arizona so it was definitely we had one of the guys in the group Stephen drake he had been down one other or two other times but this was first time for three of us down there and so you know we had asked a couple folks and got some pointers on where to look and then also just you know the strategy on how to do it and then Really, we were just learning as we went. Were you able were you to, able obviously, to your um, marketing project coordinator for OnX, were you able to use OnX uh, to, you know, help benefit your hunt? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were, uh, you know, first coming to a new area, I, I bet I spent two to three weeks just sitting there with the web map open, and I was just scouting from the computer, you know, just checking areas out, finding water, I was really looking for these main roads that, for one, you know, we had to find a camp spot, and we wanted to be mobile. We were, we just, two of the gentlemen drove down from Missouri, or from Montana, and then I rented a rig, and so we just had a mobile camp, and we'd just go wherever, you know, wherever we ended up, and we ended up finding a pretty good camp spot, and so then we were just kind of scouting it out and trying to find spots, and we'd go check them out the first couple days, and then we'd cross them off and figure out that those ones weren't worth our time, and couple of them ended up panning out and so really for us we were using you know we were using the topography to kind of get a lay of the land but also try to find these areas away from the roads that we think you know are getting overlooked deer might be we were looking for water but then on top of that we're hunting in a group of four so if we're sitting there and you know we needed to have a meetup location we'd just share a waypoint and luckily we were kind of in and out of cell service so we were able to share some waypoints to meet up for lunch or if we wanted to hunt there were a couple days we hunted in a group of four the one thing with it is where we were hunting you know it's national forest and so we had ton of public land to cover so we didn't have to worry about boundaries as much but really the biggest thing for us was being able to mark waypoints on these areas and be able to navigate through them but then also just getting the lay of the land with the topography it's all so new and we're just glassing but when you get down there, you know, you want to definitely be able to mark these kind of points of interest that you want to come back to and also just have a track so we could just backtrack and make sure we're staying in the same area. We're not disrupting country and just, you know, aimlessly walking through a bunch of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a question going into it, I'm, I'm curious how you do it. I know how I do it, but um, when you were planning your trip, do you go in and mark a bunch of roads? Uh, so that when you get there, they're already, you know, marked? Or do you then just breadcrumb feature, you know, as you drive, and then it leaves your mark where you were? I'm curious how far, you know, like, do you, do you, I go in and mark all kinds of points that I think would be great glassing points. I try and mark all the roads um, and any points of interest, water holes. I'm just curious how you uh, travel throughout the uh, desktop and the, the, the app and use it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Steve, had, he had driven through this area and kind of checked it out um, in previous years. So he had the main roads that he actually had the tracker on, and he was leaving that breadcrumb. And he had a couple p- spots that he had checked out, 
and we have those as places to look at. And so what he actually did is when you go to WebMap on our website, you just go to the My Content and you just click Export. And he exported all that data and all those tracks and waypoints, sent the file over to us, and then we just opened WebMap and imported them in. And so that gave us a good starting point. And then when we went down there to find our first camp spot, they beat us. One, um, one guy, Connor, flew in from Las Vegas, and then when I flew in, we had to meet up, and so they just shared the waypoint with us. But we were then marking a ton of waypoints, and what's cool is when you mark them you know, on web map and all the stuff we imported, it syncs directly to our phone. So we were able to just pull it up right on our phone and navigate to these areas. And so we did a mix. We would share you know, individual waypoints that we wanted to say like camp or here's a good water hole or here's a glassing spot to start for day one. We'd just click tap on that waypoint and tap share and then text it to each other. But then on the bigger data that Steve had had previous, he exported it out and then we would just import it in and make sure it's on our map. Okay, and that's where I want to talk to you about some stuff as well as taking stuff from Google Earth and importing it into, uh, you're calling it the web map, correct? Yep, yep. So it's just, you know, okay. we have... We have our hunt app, and then we have just the web map. And so really it's the same thing. It's, you know, you can see all your data. One's on a computer, and then the other one's on your smartphone. Okay. One of the things that I have not done, I have imported from Google Earth into the web map, and then it has then transferred onto the app on my phone, which is phenomenal. Uh, down in Mexico, they don't really have topo maps like we have up here because, you know, obviously they don't have the capabilities that, that you know, our, our, government agencies, our government agencies do here. Um, but one of the things that's been awesome for me in Mexico has been able to uh, take that data and import it onto the web map and then it transfers onto my phone. But on these ranches that we're hunting down in Mexico, you know, Mexico is pretty much 99% uh, private land. But there are ranch boundaries, which I go in and put the fences in, put the roads in, put you know, put, label all of that, uh, and then I import it, and then I have it on my phone. Uh, the one question I would ask you, which I have not tried, is when you're going into my content on the web map, how, do you just, like I'm looking at my web map now, and, and it's basically labeled by dates, like 1220, 1224, and then there's all these um, waypoints or, or paths or what have you that I've done on that day. How do you just import, like if I wanted to import everything I did on 1224, is it just as simple as highlighting the box and clicking export file? And then are you emailing that? How are you sending that to your buddies where it automatically then uh, all they have to do is import it and it shows up on their web map? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, if you have on the top on your My Content, you can go by date or if you wanted to see like your tracks, your waypoints, lines, or areas, there's a little drop-down arrow and you can click on that and they would just pull those ones up. Um, but if we wanted to just specify like a specific date and you wanted to export it out to send off, all you would do is up top, Right now, it you know defaulted as select all, so it's selecting everything. But you just unselect that, and then you go to the date range that you want, and tap that range, and then click export. And all it's going to do is going to export it out, and it's just going to be a file for you. And yeah, usually the best way that we found is we just email it to them, and then all they need to do is open web map, save that file to their computer, and then you click import and find that, and then it'll upload directly. Okay, that's fantastic. I didn't. I hadn't hadn't messed with that. Um, uh, I hadn't messed with that yet. But that's really sweet. Now, and I also see here where the drop down menu is. You can go by date. You can just do tracks, where it just pulls up your tracks, just pulls up your waypoints, lines, or areas. Um, so that's that's pretty sweet. I know that there's a size limitation. When I'm importing files from Google Earth into the web map, I know that there's a size limitation. My question is, when you're importing from web map, or excuse me, exporting from web map to, uh, you know, you're saving it as a folder on your file that you're then going to email to your hunting partner, is there a size restriction that when they open it that it won't um, you know, when they go to my content, it won't distribute and save successfully. Have you found there a size restriction? Yeah, so we found, you know, 
it used to be, especially if you were importing or if you were exporting from Google Earth and you were going to import it in here, the biggest one is like the breadcrumbs or any trails or lines. Those are individual points, so those got pretty big. And we actually did have a restriction. It was like half a megabyte or something like that. But we've changed that now, so now it, we've actually upped that up. And really, you shouldn't have an issue unless it's something like you have, you know, 150 giant tracks that are, you know, 50 miles long. But we've actually changed that now, so now there really shouldn't be issues, especially if you're coming from on X if you're exporting out. The biggest thing that we found is there's really three kind of files that you can import. And so with those, you know, you have your GPX, and that's if you have it on a Garmin GPS or Basecamp, those points that come in if you want to import them in. Then there's your KMLs, which are used on Google Earth, and then there's KMZ, and really all a KMZ is is it's just a zipped file of a KML. And the thing is is it looks small right away, but if you're saving all that data, there's all that in top on top of it. And so WebMap, has had issues where it actually, you know, unzipping that and then getting that data, it can be a little cumbersome. So what we generally recommend is just take the section of KML files, export them out that way, and import them in. It's just a little simpler. It cuts out one step, and you shouldn't have an issue from there. And really, if you do find an issue, if it's, you know, an entire state and 10 years' worth of data, the biggest thing we recommend is maybe just break it into chunks by, like, date range or something like that. But since we've upped it up with WebMap recently, it, we haven't really experienced any issues. Okay, so that answers my question, and I learned something on the KML and the KMZ because uh, typically when, when I save a file, whether it be Google Earth, I, uh, obviously I haven't done it yet in the WebMap, but I'm excited to be able to share that. Um, I, I send it as a KML, and when people send me KMZs, uh, it, it seems like the difficulty is always wrapped around the KMZ. So in essence, a KMZ is, is, is what you're saying. It's like a zip file of the KML, which sometimes creates a communication problem with computer to computer. So a KML is actually a better uh, file to send. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can just run into some things with KMZs where maybe it wasn't zipped correctly or whatever. But with the KML, it's just looking at each individual point. So it's much easier just to import them in that way. And we just notice that we have substantially less issues with KMLs. Okay. And um, I heard you talking about the feature where you can text your waypoint uh, to your buddy uh, and, you know, send, send a point. Uh, can you also send tracks uh, through that way, or is that file too big to send? Tracks, not currently, but it is coming. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, why don't we, um, Zach, why don't we, uh, I, I kind of jumped into the KMLs and probably got fairly in-depth where people that aren't familiar with Onyx, maybe their head's spinning a little bit. Let's back up just a little bit and have you kind of go through the, the map layers and some of the main features of uh, Onyx Maps because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Google Earth junkie, I'm an Onyx Maps junkie, I'm a general maps junkie, and so a lot of this, you know, may be advanced for some people. So let's kind of back up and talk about the capabilities of both the web map and the uh, phone app um, for the listeners out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So really what, you know, what we do and what we specialize in and where we started is we had a Garmin chip that had public, private land boundaries as well as hunting units, and it put it on your Garmin so you could view it, color coded. And so what we did is everyone had smartphones, and they requested this of us about five years ago, six years ago. And so essentially what we're doing is we are utilizing the GPS in your phone, not in our app, but actually in your phone, and we're showing your location on public and private and a bunch of other layers. So you can actually use this phone without service and navigate these boundaries while seeing aerial imagery and all the data you want. And so we kind of have two membership tiers. We have a premium membership that's one state, and then we have an elite, which is all 50. And what that does is you get a, a GPS for free. If you install the app, you can get the base maps, you can mark waypoints, and you can see your location for free. It doesn't require you to purchase it. But if you want to be able to see this data and be able to see this public landowner names or this 
or I mean private landowner names or public land, that's what you're purchasing. And so each state, let's say we buy one state, Arizona, for example, you purchase Arizona and you go into my layers. What this is, is this is the data that you want to see. And so you're going to see your Arizona private lands, your government lands, your GMUs, all your hunting districts, and then there's a couple others that are state specific. And so we have possible access. This is, you know, we have this throughout the country, but what it typically is is like private timber companies or other privately owned um, entities that might allow public access. It's still your responsibility to see because it varies by state, but it's just areas that might you might be allowed to access. And then we have a couple others. Arizona, for example, we have Arizona game distributions and some recreational sites. And then on top of that, we also have some a la carte layers. And so with these, you know, there's a, a bunch of different ones, but this is your roads and trails. We have, um, like, the NWTF Turkey um, layer, which will give you a heat map, and all these different hunt-specific layers that you can add and choose to turn them on, and you'll be able to see all the data. And if, you know, you don't want to use it anymore, all you do is tap that layer and shut it off. And so you can really customize your map to see the actual data you're looking for. Whether it's, you know, you're talking about Mexico, that, for example, we, we're not in Mexico, but if you had a ranch that you're only hunting private land, you know the boundaries, you probably don't need that public land layer. So you can turn that off so your map's cleaner and you just see the boundaries that you want with the landowner names. For me, for example, when I was in Arizona, I didn't really have to worry about private land because it was just big national forest, so... I didn't even have it active. I just had the public lands layer, and I was just able to see that I was on National Forest. Um, and what's cool is you can go in and change all your different, uh, like GMUs, for example. You can turn on, like in Montana, we have different units for each species. So if you tap the layer settings, you can turn them on and see your elk districts or your deer or moose, sheep, and goat. And so you can really customize it for whatever you're doing that day. And so really, you know, the biggest thing is that's what you were purchasing. You were purchasing the ability to see this data on the map. And then on top of that, with our free stuff, this kind of gets into our functions. And with our functions, you know, we kind of have some main ones that really are bread and butter and they're where you're getting your value. And one huge misconception is people think you need service to use the app when you're in the field. But actually, all our smartphones have a GPS that's not, you know, it has nothing to do with our app. It's in all the smartphones. And so if you go to off-grid, you can actually save the map, and you can save in three different levels, a 5x5 five five mile, 10x10, 10 10, or 50x50. 50 50. And essentially what it's doing is saving a screenshot on your phone. And what this does is it allows you to pull it up when you're out of service. You can view all your layers and actually see the blue dot where your current location is. You can mark waypoints. You can have the little breadcrumb tracker so you can keep track of everything, and it will all save to your phone, and then as soon as you hit service or Wi-Fi, it will sync up to your account to save it. And so that's a pretty cool feature that a lot of folks, you know, don't always understand that it's not something that you have to, you know, you can only use with service. It's, you know, in a lot of places you're kind of going in and out, and if you're relying on your phone, a big issue is battery life. And, what we found is if you put your phone on airplane mode and you just use those save maps, you will extend your battery by 4x. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, um, saving those maps offline and, you know, being in areas that don't have cell service, which, you know, happens to me a lot, has been unbelievable. But to still have the capability where, you know, you're, you're on airplane mode, so your battery's being saved, but you've got the little blue dot and it's tracking everywhere you go, um, and, you know, like I said, I was just down in Mexico scouting and, you know, already had the Onyx uh, app all dialed in with roads and everything on there and then could zoom in and, you know, uh, looking at a new ranch, like, you know, what's over the next hill, you can zoom in. And the five, I have to say, like that five-mile resolution, the highest resolution, um, you know, it would take, you know, a couple of those to uh, sa save a, a ranch. But, I mean, you can zoom in. The, it, the quality, the clarity of your zoom in uh, on that high resolution is amazing. And to be able to have that blue dot tracking you wherever you're at, that doesn't necessarily mean for the listeners that you're uh, leaving your tracker or your breadcrumb. 
uh, you, which you can, where it tracks everything you do. But it, it's so nice to be able to pull it up. You know, you're hiking around, you're like, where the heck am I? I just, in relation to that water tank and that glassing point, and you just pull up and whoop, there's your blue dot, and you know exactly where you're at. It's it's really nice. It's the phone app, uh, Onyx phone app has. I mean, I don't even carry a GPS anymore. It's basically replaced. Uh, I used to use a GPS like crazy, and I don't even carry a, you know a standard like Garmin GPS anymore at all. Yeah, yeah. I actually uh, I started with the chip before I started working here, and then. I used it for a couple years, but I haven't touched a GPS for about three years now. Yeah, and, and for me, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that a GPS is awesome, but it's just another thing to carry. And if you have it on your phone, which you're already going to take, I mean, everybody's carrying their phone to, you know, phone scope stuff, take pictures, take video, uh, and then, of course, to be able to use their phone, check emails, what have you. It's, it, it just seems like such an incredible tool and I've really enjoyed using it. Um, it it's, it's just awesome. Talking about these map layers, uh, one thing I like is it shows like BLM, it shows state land, uh, it even shows like I was sheep hunting and it shows like the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge, it shows the New Water Mountains ref, uh, wilderness area, shows you where the boundaries are. Um, and I like the um, I'm not sure what you call it, but it's like the transparency. You can actually make that layer uh, more transparent or less transparent, meaning like I'm looking at my uh, web map now, and it comes up as New Water Mountains Wilderness, and it's in yellow, and the uh, Kofa National Wildlife Refuge is in kind of a green color. And I like how you can, um, you know, almost see through it. It's translucent. So it, it's there, but you have full capability of the aerial. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's really up to you if it's, you know, especially if you're trying to look at aerial imagery, being able to turn that transparency down so you can see, like for turkeys, for example, if you're looking for some timber and stuff, being able to see that, it's really nice. And, you know, that's our biggest thing is we just want to make it customizable for how you're, you know, every hunter is going to use it. And so you can change it to the way of your liking. Yeah, and or you can have the hybrid where it has, um, you know, the topo and the aerial. So the topo is basically overlaid over the aerial. Um, you know, take turkey, turkey hunting, for instance. If you've got birds, you know, roosted on a contour line, uh, which they often do, um, and, you know, you're on your aerial and you see the timber, but you can't tell the slope. I mean, literally, you can turn it on and go, okay, there's the, there's the contour and there's the timber. Those birds are roosted right there. So it's been an eye-opener for me using this app. Um, I also want to remind the listeners, um, you know, Onyx has been supporting my podcast now for a couple of months uh, as a sponsor. Um, and if you use the JScott19 promo code, you're going to get a 20% discount uh, there at onyxmaps.com. Uh, Zach, talk about, um, you know, the premium membership versus the elite membership. And, you know, obviously I'm in multiple states with the Ot6 Ranch in Colorado and hunting in Utah and New Mexico and, um, you know, some of the different states, Arizona, that I hunt in. Uh, you know, would you say that most people are, you know, kind of using that uh, premium, just the, you know, the one state, or are most people going with the elite because they're traveling around hunting different places? Um, we, I would say, well, the majority would be premium. It'd be a single state, but there are a ton of folks who are getting it. Even if they're, you know, just they want to hunt it. Maybe they haven't yet, but they, you know, they're building points or they're planning on hunting another state or they want to hunt another, another state. We find that folks, you know, prefer to buy it. You get all 50 for 99 bucks a year, and that allows you, you know, maybe you're traveling to scout it and you want to get a lay of the land now and you're planning for a couple years from now. Just being able to pull up and see where you're at and whose land it is throughout the country is pretty um, enticing for folks. So there's definitely a ton of people who choose elite, but right now, you know, we still see that one state, a lot of folks are hunting their home state, and so that's just the one they need. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, land ownership and uh, the value that being able to see the private land versus public land, and not only that, like the boundaries, uh, uh, the way that properties are shaped, the way that like public land might, you know, 
in not a perfect, you know, like uh, a square or rectangle, like sometimes private and public, you know, there's some curvature, there's some triangles, there's some different shapes. Being able to see that overlay on the map, whether it be on the topo, the hybrid, or uh, the aerial feature, um, you know, talk about that. Obviously, in Arizona, our state's 17% private and, you know, 83% public. So we don't have those issues as much. Uh, but, you know, like I, I'm the hunt manager over there at the Ot 6 Ranch in Colorado, and there's private land, you know, all over. Uh, and I know Montana has a bunch of private. Talk, talk about, from your perspective, the value of that um, being able to show private and public ownership. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the biggest thing is just knowing where you're at and where you can hunt. So if you have access to a place, a piece of private ground, knowing where that boundary is and making sure you're not venturing off. Or if you're on public ground, you know, there's fences that don't always align with boundaries. They, you know, sometimes they might go down a ridge instead of going through the middle of the drainage. And so it really just helps you. It allows you to see exactly where you're at and be confident when you're hunting and not worrying that, you're trespassing or you're venturing off your ranch or anything like that. And so for me, you know, in Montana, antelope hunting, for example, eastern Montana is a big checkerboard. It's, you know, it's a ton of just public, private, public, private. And those antelope might be on, you know, they, there might not be a fence. A lot of times there's not. But I'm able just to look down and see that this is a set, you know, it might be as small as a section. It might be a mile by a mile. And I'm able to go out there and see exactly where I'm at with that blue dot and be able to hunt it confidently and navigate those boundaries. And sometimes, like you were saying, it's not a perfect square. And it kind of, you know, the shapes can be kind of off and you have to navigate around boundaries to stay on the public ground. And so being able to see the color coded, whether it's blue for state or yellow for BLM or green for national forest, and be able to navigate around and see those boundaries. But then also, there's been times as well that, I've wanted to ask a landowner for permission. And so we Absolutely. have the private landowner's names on there. And if, you, if you're on the app, you just tap on it. If you're on web map, you click on it, and it'll pull up their address, their name, tell them, you know, it'll tell you the size, the acreage of it, and then the tax county, state or city and state. And so it allows you to have a little bit more information instead of just walking up there not knowing their name and saying, you know, hello, sir, I would like to hunt your place. This gives you a little information so you can at least be informed before you go approach them about accessing their property. Yeah, and I mean, I've even seen it work where you have their name, you have the address, you can do a little Googling, you could do a little, you know, search on Facebook sometimes, and boom, all of a sudden you've got the person's phone number, you've got their contact on Facebook. I mean, you can reach out and say, hey, my name's Jay, I'm, I'm from Arizona, I'm up here, you know, duck hunting. And, um, you know, I noticed you got some ducks on your property. I uh, just wanted to reach out and see if you wanted, you know, would you accept an, a, an access fee or something for me to come shoot some ducks or, um, you know, you, you got some turkeys or, you know, you might find that the, the landowner says, yeah, of course, come by, you know, come by my office or come by the house. I'd like to meet you. And, um, I mean, it can't hurt to, to ask politely. And it's an unbelievable way to have the information right there of the owner uh, and potentially gain access to ground that, you know, whether, whether you're on a piece of private and you want to know the private next door or you're on public and want to know private. So um, one question I would have that I've gotten a few people have asked me is obviously with land uh, ownership changing hands so often, uh, you know, it, it's almost impossible to keep that data, you know, by the day correct because of, of things selling and what have you. But how often does that, uh, does ownership get reflected and changed? Do you guys have to go in and do it manually? Is it off of the assessor's data? Like, and, and then sometimes the assessor's data is sometimes behind. How do you navigate and work through that as a company? Yeah, yeah. So we actually have... 20 GIS employees where that's their sole focus is making sure this map is as accurate as possible. And you're correct. I mean, it changes frequently. You know, public land will stay, but private land, we get that from the counties. And the thing that's tough, you're correct. I mean, it, it's not always updated. And that's the thing that's great with our customers is you can actually 
you know, we appreciate it if something's off and you send it in and tell us because we'll look into it. If it's, you know, if it's wrong on our end, we're going to make sure we fix it. But if it's, you know, the counties aren't updated, then we can go to the county and say, hey, we need this data more accurate if we're going to have it in here. And so we typically try to update every single state at least once a year, and sometimes there's multiple updates. And these guys, you know, the one thing that's tough is we're compiling this data from many different sources, and it's all out there. Anyone can get it, but the thing that's tough is the boundaries don't always align. So you'll have a public and private boundary that will lay over top of each other, and there won't be an actual fence line or a boundary line. And so what we do is we take that error out, and we, we go in, and we try to make sure they're accurate and work with all the sources to find where the actual boundary is and which one's most up-to-date and accurate. And so we're typically updating every year, working with the counties. But then also on top of that is we have, you know, every single one of our customers is essentially an employee for us because we get a ton of feedback on, you know, hey, this this county is outdated or, you know, this has been, I purchased this a year ago and it hasn't been updated yet. And then we're able to go back and look into it. And we actually have two guys in customer service who are working just on map errors and going through and when they come in, we'll go through, try to figure them out, make sure they're not an issue on our end, and then we'll go work with the county to try to get them updated. So in other words, I mean, I'm sure you have situations where you have, you know, several people that call in and like, you haven't changed it yet. You guys, and, and I'm sure you catch some flack, but we're talking about 50 states here and ownership, you know, issues all over the country. But what you do say is you do have people that are nonstop working on that. So... If, if you notice that there's something that needs to be updated, a simple email or a phone call to customer service and then just kind of staying on top of it, but uh, wouldn't you agree that, you know, as, as a landowner or, or, or even just a public citizen, you have to give a little bit of leeway in that this company is dealing with 50 states out there and, uh, you know, it's a lot of data to go through for even 20 GIS employees or even two customer service people that that's all they do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I don't want to give us too much slack. You know, we definitely are working to keep it as accurate as possible, but the biggest thing that we see is someone will buy something, they'll buy a property, and it doesn't reflect it within a month or something like that, and that's just because we haven't had an update cycle at that point. And, you know, so we're really dependent on the counties, especially for the private data. We can't do anything until they have it digitized. So it, it, they have to get it first, and then we're able to get it from them and then cross-reference and make sure it's accurate. But... We, you know, we understand, we want it, you know, I, I don't want any boundaries or private landowners' names that I'm using, I don't want them incorrect either, so we hold ourselves to a pretty high standard, and we honestly appreciate when folks send those in and let us know, because it just helps us make our product better. Uh, you, you mentioned updates, uh, and how does one update their phone app, how does one update the web map, does it do it automatically if you're on Wi-Fi, talk about updating, because I know... With the old chip system and what have you, you had to update chips. How does it work now? Yeah, so you still, if you have a chip um, product, you still update it yearly. And so what we do is we offer you the membership, and the membership is your way to update the chip. You actually just log into WebMap, and then if you have a current membership, you plug your chip in. Down at the bottom, there's a chip updater, and it'll run it and update that. But on the app, as long as you're connected to Wi-Fi or service, it's going to constantly update. So if we push an update for private parcels for a specific county, as soon as you hit service, it's going to reflect that. And so that's the beauty with the app. The only thing you have to be careful of is if you have a saved map from before that update, it won't reflect that. So you'll have to go back and resave that map, and that's because it's essentially saving a screenshot. Um, but otherwise, you know, let's say for Arizona, for example, I saved my maps two days before I went. And so I made sure I had everything saved. I had all the different um, Zoom levels that I wanted saved. And as soon as I hit service or Wi-Fi, it was completely updated, and then I just saved it on there, and I was good to go. I want to bounce back to something we were talking about before where we were talking about sharing data with your buddy and having, you know, Let's say that you and I go deer hunting on that deer hunt you just got off of, and I'm covering country for three days, and I'm hitting all these spots, and you're covering country, and, and, you, and we both want to say, hey, I want all your data, and 
and you want all my data. Tell me again how the how cool that is, but tell me how you physically do that. Yeah. Yep. So if you're doing, you know, and the one thing I do want to preface is right now sharing a waypoint from app to app, you just tap on the waypoint and click share. So it's a single waypoint at a time, but we are changing that. We, you know, we've, I want to be able to share more data from my phone and we've had a lot of requests. So that's coming, but the best way is let's say, you know, we have access to the computer. The best way would be go in, export it out of your web map. It'll export out of the KML. I'll take that file and I'll send it to you and then you just pull up your web map, click import, select that file on your computer and it'll pull up all my tracks, all my areas, shapes and waypoints. It'll have them all in there and ready to go and then you would just send me your data and I'd import them in and then that way, you know, let's say we went on, you know, you went one weekend, I went on another but we were meeting up, we could compile all our data and have everything ready for when we're hunting together. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Let's talk about uh, Google Earth a little bit, and because I, I, I've been a Google Earth junkie for many years, and have lots of files, on, you know, saved um, for you know all kinds of different stuff: public land, private land, different states, different countries, you name it. Um, talk about exporting files from Google Earth into the web map. Um, if there's anything to watch out for, any tips or tricks or what have you. Yeah, yeah. One thing, you know, this is something that, especially with, you know, we had a lot of chip users who are now app users, and so they were using Basecamp. We have folks who are using Google Earth. The 3D is phenomenal in being able to get, a, you know, another view of the land. And so we've, you know, out of necessity, we built a step-by-step -step way to do this. And so it'll walk you through with, pictures, if you go to our website, click support down at the bottom and then you just click web map, it will have everything, how to export from Onyx, how to import from or into Onyx, how to export from Google Earth, Basecamp, import to them. And so it's really just a great place that it'll walk you through step by step. It, you know, I like seeing the pictures. I like the visual. It just helps me out. But with Google Earth, all you're going to do is you're going to go in there and you have your different files and you can label those however you want. You know, so if you have deer hunt, you have a couple different points and lines that you want in there, all you'll do is you'll select all them, save it. Um, you just click, right click on it, save place as, and then it'll save it to your computer as, and, you know, as we were talking earlier. You want to make sure if you have a ton of data, let's, you want to make sure to save it as a KML. It's just much correct, easier to correct, import correct. and, you you know you'll have substantially less issues that way, and so once you save that um, to your computer, all you got to do is pull up web map. You go to my content, click import, and then you'll just find that folder. It'll say deer hunt on there. You select it, and then it'll import them all into your into your web map. And then as soon as your phone hits service or Wi-Fi, it'll sync it directly to your phone. And is it? Uh, it is Wi-Fi. It's not just LTE service, right? Or does it does it uh, sync it if it if it's LTE as well? Yep, both. So if you have service really? or Wi-Fi, yep. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Well, um, I want to give you a chance. If you feel like we did not cover anything, both on the web map and on the phone app, uh, that the listeners that I haven't covered, I want to give you a chance to uh, point that out. Uh, right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, just taking one away from this Arizona trip, it was, uh, you know, that country is, it's tough. It's, there's, especially in those big flats, there's not a ton of landmarks when you're stalking. And so one thing we did is we were able to actually just mark a waypoint where that bedded buck was that I was stalking in on. So I had a rough idea, you know, and I can't drop it exactly where he is, but I can kind of look with the topography and kind of see and then what else I did is I actually took a picture with my phone. And so that way I get a lay of the land and I can kind of see. And there was about three dead trees up there. And I knew one was about 100 yards to his right, one was about 50 yards to his left, and there was one right above him. And so as I'm going down on the stock, I was able to actually use that photo and the app to at least get a lay of the land and kind of pick and choose once I got the wind right and try to find the best way to stock in on that deer. And you know, that waypoint's not going to take me right to them, but it's at least going to get me close to where I know I'm in the red zone and I really need to slow down, you know, be glassing a ton, looking around. But 
you know, I did that, and there were a couple times where it, you get down there and it looks nothing like you expected when you're up top. Everything totally changes. changes. You lose all your landmarks. And I was actually able to look at the picture. You know, I got the app, so I got to where I thought I was about 150 yards. But then I looked at the picture, and I was able to find the first tree that I figured was about 100 yards to his right. So I, I got the wind in my favor, and I kept moving slowly, glassing below each tree, and I was able to find the next dead one. And I ended up getting to 46 yards, and I needed to get around one tree. And I came, and I tried to draw, and he ended up picking me off. But... It was just one of those things that, you know, if I would have went down there blind and just tried to, you know, guess where he was, I think he's on top of the hill, there's a couple of shrubs here, like maybe he's right there, I would have never made it in there or else I would have been going too fast and, you know, I would have had no idea where he was. So being able to just drop that waypoint on and see exactly, you know, where he was on the hillside so I could at least get in close and I knew that I really needed to slow down at that point, that was one thing that, we use quite often down there. And another one that, you know, it was unique for Arizona is I saw that you can't uh, camp next to water sources or building structures, um, I believe is a half mile. Um, quarter mile. Quarter mile. And yep. so we there was one down there, there was a great campsite, and we figured it was too close, but then we found another one from a water tank. And so what we were able to do is actually take our line tool put a dot on where our camp was and then put one over there and we found out that we we're three quarters of a mile away and so we we're good to go we we're safe and you know visually i could look and i you know we could use a range finder but we were down kind of below and couldn't get a good look so we were able just to drop those two lines and know exactly that you know we we're safe and we we're good to go from that point and that's also something i've used you know trying to get rough ideas for shots on for sure um, during rifle season, you know, especially in canyons, it's kind of tough to judge distance. If you have some snow conditions and your rangefinder's not working, I've done stuff, dropped a couple points, and realized from this clearing to that tree and that opening, it's 300 yards, you know. So, and I know the way I'm set up that I'll be fine if I hold it just a touch high, especially on like an elk-sized critter. So, there's a couple ways that really, I mean, it's just there's unique ways to use it, but. You, as you start using it, you start kind of finding what works for you and you find different ways to use it. And so really the biggest thing is, I think, is, you know, you always offer great tips. And I think, you know, checking out how other people use it, asking questions how they do, um, you're always, you know, very gracious on showing folks how you do it, marking out private boundaries and being able to see it, marking the roads so you can see which ones. Maybe, maybe some are washed out or it's a bad two-track. And so... You know, like when we were in Arizona, we had all the main roads. We would drop a track on them, and we changed color so we knew which ones were main yeah, roads yeah. and which ones were two tracks, stuff like that. Yeah, I love changing the colors, and, you know, like all my property boundaries are, are red. Um, all my, you know, like a main road is green, like the, a main two-tracker is white. And what's nice is you can look at that and go, oh, yeah, that's a main road, that's a two I mean, if you have a system and have the ability to change colors of your lines, it's incredible. Um, for sure, Jack, it's been an awesome conversation. I appreciate you spending time with us uh, for sure. And uh, I, I want to give you a chance to, well, bef before I sign off, I really didn't even get an intro with anything about you, your background, uh, where you live, uh, anything about you. So why don't, we, why don't we end with that? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, I'm from Western Montana, Missoula, Montana, where our uh, headquarters is actually at. And I started using Onyx before I started working here when it was on the chip. And then after I graduated college, they uh, had an internship opened, and I jumped at it. I wanted to work for this company. I was passionate. I used it. And I've been here now for three years. And so now my kind of responsibility is I, I work with our partners, but then I also help just manage the projects that the team's working on as a marketing team and all our communications, and it's great. I get to work with great people. I get to do good stuff, and I get to talk hunting every day, which is fantastic. And the thing that's awesome is I get to see, you know, all these stories on how people are using the app and how it's helping them out, and those are really what keep us going. And it's just, you know, it's great when you get to see something you're working on and your team and the company's working on help improve people's time in the field. And really for us, like anyone, 
hunting time is just so sacred. And for some folks, it might be a week. And our biggest thing is we want to make sure you maximize that and you're not worrying about where you can and cannot hunt. We want to be able to, you know, make it so you're confident, you know where you're going, and you can just focus on hunting. You don't have to worry about whose land it is or how to access it or anything like that. And so it's been, you know, it's been a fast three years, but I've really enjoyed it and I'm looking forward, you know, we got a lot of great things coming out this year and years to come and I'm looking forward to, you know, many more years of doing this. Well, that's awesome, Zach. I appreciate you spending time with us today. I want to remind the listeners to use the JSCOT19 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount there at onyxmaps.com. Uh, Zach, sorry you couldn't connect on a deer here in Arizona, but I'm glad you kind of wet your whistle and uh, got to get down and see all of the public ground that we do have and the opportunities uh, that we do have uh, here and, uh, you know, one of the cool things, if you ever come back in January, is, you know, you, obviously January 1st would be the start of the new year. And so your life, your tag, you'd have to buy a new tag. But then you could actually hump that tag on our August uh, over-the-counter season. So don't forget that as well. Um, and, and with that as well, you could hump this January as well as next December uh or this December coming up, and it all be within the calendar year. So Arizona does have a lot of opportunity, especially for over-the-counter deer. So come on back, and um, I appreciate the time you spent with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. And, yeah, I'm definitely Arizona's going to be on my to-do list each year. I mean, anytime you can extend your archery opportunity, I'm all for it. And it was a great time. And, I mean, I had plenty of chances. It's just, you know, bow hunting can be tough, especially in a new new terrain and, it's, uh, I'm already looking forward to my next trip down. All right, buddy. Well, sounds good. Thanks for sharing with us. God bless you, okay? Yeah, thank you. Have a good one.